The Heli Cancer Chain Show airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. The podcast always available online at HeliCancerChain.com. So talk to me in terms of being a filmmaker, because that had to get your juices going, to go into something like this and say, how am I going to capture this and really create what this is on film? Talk to me about that. You know, you film and dance are antithetical forms. They're almost enemy forms, I would say. I mean, dance is now. Ballet is happening in a kind of eternal present tense, which is both its curse and its blessing. Film is exactly the opposite. It's in the can. It's never now, or rather the thing that's now is something which is repeatable infinitely. So the question for film is how do you actually capture dance in this medium without destroying that extraordinary blessing and curse, which is its patrimony? And what we determined really early on was we were going to get as pornographically close to the dancers as we possibly could. So it was just going to be about intimacy, a kind of intimacy that might be hard to get even if you're sitting in the front row. As pornographically close to the dancers? Oh, that Rick Burns. He has as interesting a way with words as he has with the use of his camera. Award-winning filmmaker Rick Burns and the American Ballet Theater's principal dancer, Isabella Boston, will be joining me at my table in a moment to discuss Rick's amazing new documentary, American Ballet Theater, A History. But first, hi, and welcome to the Hallie Caster Jane Show. I am Hallie Caster Jane. Today, the Hallie Caster Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Get a free audiobook and 30-day trial today by signing up at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Hallie Caster Jane Show. And remember, The Hallie Caster Jane Show is always available online at HallieCasserJane.com and a host of venues including iHeartRadio, Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, TuneIn Radio, iTunes, and Blog Talk Radio. We begin with Rick Burns, an internationally recognized documentary filmmaker and writer, best known for his series, New York, a documentary film, which premiered nationally on PBS. Burns has been writing, directing, and producing historical documentaries for over 20 years since his collaboration on the celebrated PBS series, The Civil War, which he produced with his brother Ken and co-wrote with Jeffrey Ward. Since founding Steeplechase Films in 1989, Burns has directed some of the most distinguished programs in the award-winning public television series, American Experience, including Coney Island, The Donna Party, The Way West, and Ansel Adams. Other films of Burns to receive critical acclaim are pieces on Eugene O'Neill and Andy Warhol. He since revisited the Civil War and Whaling. Educated at Columbia University in Cambridge, the former English professor is the recipient of two Peabody Awards, three DuPont Awards, and seven Emmys. Now he's reached new heights with his latest critically acclaimed film, American Ballet Theater, A History, a feature-length documentary celebrating the rich history and legacy of America's first ballet company, the film time to coincide with the company's 75th anniversary. Banned on the eve of World War II, American Ballet Theater sought to bring dance to America and American dance to the world. Let's talk. So, Rick, just just an amazing resume, and, and now just another amazing film, American Ballet Theater of History. It is so exquisite, exquisite, but from Coney Island to the AB team, and that's just quite a leap, or Isabella, who's on the other line, is a cabriole, is that how you guys say it? How did all this come about? <laughs> you know... Yeah, you know, I was. I, I'm, first of all, thank you so much. You know, I was sort of your average um, ballet attender up until about ten years ago, when a, a friend, uh, a wonderful sort of balletta main, I got it into her head that my colleagues and I should do a film about American ballet theater, and took us to the ballet. And sort of, I had an out of body experience one day, sort of standing in the wings at City Center, where ABT has its fall season and watching an extraordinary performance of Apollo and a Balanchine, wonderful Balanchine piece and sort of kind of got the 
incredible immediacy and power of the form in a way that somehow had not registered with me before. And the sense of what dance is, classical ballet is in general, but then also the particular embodiment of it in American Ballet Theater, which has been, you know, I think by any yardstick, the premier American dance company, um, it, with, with the emphasis in a funny way both on premier but also on American. I mean, it just sort of started in this kind of spontaneous way out of the 1930s and 40s and rolled across the last 75 years. Here we are celebrating its 75th anniversary. But there's something about the combination of aspiration to ballet excellence on the one hand and achievement of it, and the sort of almost bewildering commingling of styles and forms, dance forms, choreographic forms, a uh, mixture of traditional and new, sometimes even avant-garde, that sort of speaks to a particularly American idea of what the form is. And that, I think, really appealed to me as well. But in any case, it was just, listen, to be thrown into the lion's den with people like Isabella over the last you know, 10 years and have, you know, you know, often a front row seat at it and to watch it and to see how powerful it is made you want to sort of take that and take it out and give it to as many people as you possibly could in the form of a film. Yeah, and I was going to say, so talk to me in terms of being a filmmaker, because that had to get your juices going, to go into something like this and say, how am I going to capture this and really create what this is, you know, on, on, on film or, you know, digital, however we work these days. Talk to me about that. You Can't know, you film and dance are antithetical forms. They're almost enemy forms, I would say. I mean, dance is now. Um, ballet is happening in a kind of eternal present tense, with it, which is both its curse and its blessing. Film is exactly the opposite. It's in the can. It's never now, or rather the thing that's now is something which is repeatable infinitely. So the question for film is how do you actually capture dance in this medium without destroying that, ex that extraordinary blessing and curse, which is its patrimony? And what we determined really early on was we were going to get as pornographically close to the dancers as we possibly could. So it was just going to be about intimacy, a kind of intimacy that might be hard to get even if you're sitting in the front row. But even more than that, to do everything film can do to give something extra, having, having stolen away immediacy, what could film give back? It could look close. It could look deeply. You could shoot it in slow motion, sometimes in super slow motion. You could add the thoughts and feelings of a couple of a dozen of extraordinary critics, dancers, choreographers, so that you're bringing to bear in the way that film can do all at once the, a kind of repertoire of tools and insights. And for us, the main one was a, was a very expensive cheap trick, which we did a lot in the film, which is to slow dance down. Sometimes slow it down by 1,500 frames a second. Film is usually 24 frames a second. Well, when you shoot Isabella at 1,500 frames a second, that means 10 seconds of performance becomes 10 minutes of film time. So what are you seeing when you kind of explode a dancer's performance in that way and draw it out? You're able to see very, very deeply into it and, and understand things, I think, almost in a... I don't know what to call it, you know, it sounds sort of Buddhist, almost in a kind of a trance-like way, be able to see something about what's happening. Often the effects that a great dancer will be achieving are things which are happening subliminally in the sense that the eye can't quite register what they're seeing, but nevertheless, it's happening. And film slowed down like that can allow you to see it, and in a way it was a metaphor for what we were trying to do. We can't give you dance in real time without sort of canning it. We're right. going to sort of flood the zone with, you know, thought, feeling, and a kind of a vision into it. And I, I felt that that just, for me, paid off. When you watch Isabella leap and see what's going on and understand that every one of those 1,500 frames has beauty in it, and not beauty in some kind of, like, cliched way, um, has something which has been won through years and years of talent and training and performance and exercise. That's an amazing thing. It certainly is. You know, this is the one other place I want to go, or a couple of places with film. Films have moods, and they also have style. It, it, like a Rembrandt painting, you know, you always know a Rembrandt. Same thing with filmmakers. But you, on this film, you go someplace that, in the work that I've seen you've done, you've never gone before. And it's different. So what I want to ask you is style. Do you want to stamp your style on a film, or do you let every piece stamp itself on Rick, so that what, what you wind up creating, it doesn't matter to you what it comes out of, doesn't have to be Rick, it has to be celebrating what it is you're capturing. 
that makes well, sense? Well, you know, that, I find that such a profound question. Listen, all of us are helplessly ourselves, whether we try to be or not. My sense has always been that if you want to continue as a filmmaker, you better not repeat yourself. You better try to do things which are different and even outside your comfort zone or at the very least what you never expected to do before. Because you know what? Guess what? At the end of the day, you're going to wake up and you're still there. But if you do something which you didn't know you wanted to do, if you do something that takes you someplace different and let the form follow absolutely the content, then what you discover is that you're actually reaching outside yourself into something new, something different. And you know what? You're not going to lose yourself anyway. We're all helplessly ourselves. You know, no matter where we go, we can go up on Mount Everest and we'll still be the people we are. And so to go up on this Mount Everest where you're really trying to understand this most exacting, in a way, poignant and heartbreaking of forms. I mean, I think it is the ultimate form because it is the form which is absolutely irreproducible. It has to happen in now. To do that then just sort of takes you someplace that might be different than a film about Coney Island or the history of New York or the Civil War. And I found that really, you know, all of us, of course, change in the situations to adapt to the situations we find ourselves in. And that's what kind of, that's the kind of the beauty part, I think, for filmmakers is... It's a voyage. You're going someplace else. And what you want to do is not then helplessly reproduce the same old thing when you get to that new place, but rather let that new place change you and take you into something else. And so, you know, we found that if you talk to Alexei Ratmansky or Jennifer Homans or Isabella or, you know, watch Misty Copeland or go to Cuba with the Amara. You're literally going places, but then also figuratively finding your way into aspects of human experience, which kind of expand who you are in a way that's fantastic. So I think the rule always has to be, as much in documentary films as in feature films, fiction films, every film should be a revolution of content, like, and let the form then adapt itself to that. And if you do that, then maybe, you know, in little stray moments, there'll be kind of little sparks of illumination. And, and otherwise, you're just kind of helplessly doomed to repeat yourself in a way that, why not just blow your brains out? <laughs> Listen to me. Before I get to Isabel, there is one other thing I, I must ask you, and that is this. After all the research that you did and everything that you saw, at the end of the day, we're talking about the American Ballet Theater and its 75th anniversary, so celebrated in this wonderful film of yours. Talk to me about what was the key, the one thing, that you discovered in all that research that helped you find your way to put this thing together? Was there one thing? You know, I think in a way, the kind of the infinitely repeated insight which dance is, is that time is fleeting. And you see in every moment of any great dancer, any great choreographer, you feel that tremendous poignancy of trying to capture something and discovering that time is going on. And what we discovered very early on is that there's a kind of analogy. Every dancer, every choreographer, the history of ABT, the history of ballet are all in a funny way metaphors for each other where each time out you're trying to go and transcend the moment in the moment. And that was really something which was really powerful to get watching this incredible crew of dancers. That You're trying to do something which is equally obedient to something transcendent and at the same time obedient to all the concrete, expedient, you know, rehearsals, performances, choreographers, training that any individual dancer brings to it. And that, you know, that combination of sort of, it's almost a hard-eyed realism about the reality of the passing of time and an undiminished aspiration to do something with it that is worth paying attention to, that is possibly aspirationally transcendent. Wow, you know, you kind of feel in that, just like, here's this form that began in the court of Louis XIV 400 years ago. It is so immediately powerful and relevant in a rollicking, fractious, conflicted democracy today, because it was like a scientific discovery that took place 400 years ago. There is a science of the expressiveness of the human form keyed to the anatomy and the human spirit. And that discovery, which I think was no less revolutionary than Galileo or Newton, brought into existence this continually self-transforming art form. And man, what an incredible thing then to be able to follow and to see it in its premier American embodiment. You know, this isn't a one choreographer company. This is a mongrel, 
mixed up, open it all up, let everybody in company, and has been since Lucia Chase um, and Richard Pleasant started it in 1940, where it's not going to be some kind of purist aesthetic. It's going to be, see what happens when you put everything into the Petri dish at once. How American is that? How right. incredibly interesting is that as an American phenomenon? You know, once you get that far in, you go, you know, there's something going on here, and it's partly to do with dance, but it's also to do with America at a specific time over a specific period of its history as this form of kings now got brought into and changed into a form which was resolutely of the people. I mean, that's, what an incredible story. And here we are accidentally at their 75th anniversary. And I would say they've never been better. Filmmaking is an art, but it's also a discipline and a sport that requires accuracy, agility, intelligence, and heart. The same can be said of the ballerina. So the filmmaker and the youngest female principal dancer currently in the American Ballet Theater's roster, 28-year-old Isabella Boston, have more than one would think in common. Isabella was born in Sun Valley, Idaho, and started taking dance classes at the age of three. Growing up, she was also an avid skier and skater. The family moved to Colorado, where she continued her ballet studies at the Academy of Colorado Ballet, and then studied at Harrod Conservatory. When she was 14, she won the gold medal at the Youth American Grand Prix competition. At the age of 17, before her senior year of high school, she was spotted by the director of the prestigious American Ballet Theater Studio Company and invited to come to New York City and begin a career at American Ballet Theater. She was promoted to soloist in 2011 and principal dancer in 2014. She is the recipient of the Clive Barnes Award, the Princess Grace Award, and the Annenberg Fellowship. She has appeared as a guest star with companies around the world, such as the Marinsky Ballet and the National Ballet of China. So, Isabella, mm-hmm. Rick's film is about the history of the American Ballet Theater. Uh, if you will, his view is from the outside in. You've got the view from the inside out. So tell us from the inside out about this company and the magic it produces. Today's magic directly related to the founder's dream. I mean, I think Rick summarized it very well, that it is, in a way, an embodiment of America. It's a melting pot. I think what's so unique about it is that we don't have the same sort of homogenous look and style that you'll find in a European company, such as the Mariinsky or maybe the National Ballet of China, where all the dancers were handpicked at a very young age, and they all went through the same school. They learned one syllabus, uh, whereas here at EBT, the dancers are from all over the world. We all come from different styles, different schools, different backgrounds. And so I think that is, I guess, what defines the style of ABT. <laughs> Let me take you further out on this. You're the poster child for what Rick captured on his film. Your story is a <laughs> story. Listen to me. It's true. What happened to you is the story of ABT. Uh, so let's look a little at that story. You started dancing at three years old. But I got to ask you. Was this your dream or your parents' dream? Talk to me. Yeah, dance was definitely my dream. I, I grew up in Sun Valley, Idaho, which is a ski town. And so, I mean, no one in my family does ballet. My dad was basically a full-time drummer and a ski bum. <laughs> and uh, my mom was worked in IT. And I think she just thought ballet is something good for a little girl to do. <laughs> so she stuck me in ballet. And I... I'm sure it never crossed anyone's mind that eventually I'd become a ballet dancer. I don't even think they knew that you could do that for your career. But I, but anyways, I yeah, I I just really loved it. I think what I fell in love with was the musicality, the physical challenge, and the freedom and creativity that came along with it, I guess. And I don't know, I discovered the rewards of working really hard and then feeling that pay off as, as you could feel yourself improving and understanding more, learning more. So you're a girl who reaches for a certain kind of perfectionism, I hear. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's true of all ballet dancers, that we're extreme perfectionists. And you kind of have to be because every day, I mean, yeah, to, in order to stay motivated to constantly improve and develop as an artist, you have to, I think, be a perfectionist. Is it is it possible to reach perfection, or is it just something that you will always be reaching for? Do you ever have that moment that says, whoa, I'm here? Oh, no, never. I mean, if I ever feel that, I think I'll have to retire the same day. Cause, yeah, so I that's think, frustrating um, to you. To me, that would drive me insane. 
insane. <laughs> You're not frustrated. I don't know. I mean, I think I'm okay with it. Of course, you do have really rewarding moments where you feel like you've reached a new level, but then there's always another level after that. <laughs> Right. So listen to me. You you really are a fairy tale. You're a character from a fairy tale. For <laughs> every oh, little gosh. no, this is true. Every little girl dreams at one point or another in their life to do what you have accomplished. Mm-hmm. Nice girl from Sun Valley, Idaho, becomes a principal <laughs> dancer and the youngest, by the way, right? Principal dancer. Uh, yeah, the youngest out of the female principals for now. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So do you pinch yourself? I do. I mean, I think it's for as long as I've known what ABT was and what a principal dancer was, that was always my dream. And I had to work really hard to get here. Of course, I feel very lucky because I, I mean, I have like pretty facile physique for ballet and I also had great teachers and supportive parents. So it's really hard to get there if you don't have those things. But I also had to work really hard and, of course, deal with some disappointments along the way. But, yeah, I'm, so and every day I feel very uh, grateful to be where I am. And unbelievable discipline you have. Making it to the top as you have is far more than the stuff of fairy tales, though, because <laughs> everything on the outside in looks like a fairy tale. I can imagine there right. were wanting to chop your feet off. They were killing you so yeah. much. Blah, 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 oh, blah, yeah. blah. Right? So how great were the sacrifices for you? And, and what were some of the sacrifices? And Do you have a childhood when you, when your focus is as intense so early on as yours was? I don't know. I mean, yeah, people talk about that a lot, like the sacrifice that you have to make, but I don't know. I never saw it as a sacrifice. It was just what I wanted to do and what I needed to do. I think I was just so focused and determined from such a young age that I didn't really see it as a sacrifice. But, I mean, I definitely didn't really get to do the things that I think most kids do, like a lot of sleepovers and hanging out after school. At one point I was taking, I was commuting every day um, on a public bus for two hours a day to get to my ballet school because they didn't have, basically I knew that I needed to get better training and um, the, that was an hour away from where mm-hmm. I lived. So that was a pretty hard um, couple of years where I would basically immediately from school hop on the bus head to ballet and then come home really late at night and then wake up early and go to school the next day. But ballet, that was my favorite part of the day. So Amazing. Something you said in an article that I read about you struck me. I have to talk to you about this. You said you show up and they expect you to be a prima ballerina. So you just, <laughs> you just have to fill their shoes. Prima ballerina, what does that mean to you? Well, I think for a long time in my career, well, I've been in EBT now for, I I moved to New York 10 years ago to join the junior company, and then a year and a half later, I joined the main company of ABT. And I think it was just what I had to work on the most was my confidence, just like trusting my intuition and being able to, I guess, believe in myself (laughs) enough to kind of give a good performance, I guess. And I think of what I've learned is that a ballerina is you have an individual approach. And, yeah, basically, I think it, it's sort of approaching your work with a certain individuality is what makes you a ballerina. I, I'm going to pose this first to Isabel, but I'm curious what you think about this, Rick, from looking from the, from the outside in. And, and that's something that comes up in terms of companies, ballet companies. You could say the same thing for theater companies, too, I'm sure. And that is the incredible competition to get the roles. You know, you saw how it was portrayed in Black Swan, Isabella. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Brutal yeah. competition. Talk to me. Yeah. Well, how real is that? How not real is that? I don't think it's very real. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot more love and hate, honestly, between the dancers in professional ballet companies. And, um, yeah, I, I think that's pretty sensationalized. I think one thing that also gets stereotyped, I think people are more and more starting to realize how athletic ballet is, but in order to be a world-class athlete, you have to take care of yourself. You can't just be trashing your body and, like, partying like crazy. So um, I think the dancers today are pretty healthy and athletic and regimented, and, and also I don't think 
there's a huge tolerance for, you know, bad behavior and drama. <laughs> so, you know, I have to say, I, I, I found, you know, as an outsider, um, you know, everything that, Isabella, you're saying, sort of so, so moving. I mean, listen, like psychopathology, rivalry, um, hate, mm-hmm. Uh, viciousness, you know, that's not a, that's not, uh, you know, anything you're going to find uniquely in ballet or any, any other human endeavor. That's no. the human nature. And that what I found looking in briefly as I did was that the form is so exacting, but then the rewards for what it does when it actually works are so high. Mm-hmm. So there's a kind of a humility that goes with the commitment dancers make. They know they could trip and they could get a bone spur tomorrow. They could break their Achilles, you know, tendon, you know, next week. Their career could be over. It's extremely hard. It's a communal effort. However much it's an individual, it takes, a, you know, more than a village to make any given performance. It takes, you know, you know, it takes the entire history of dance and the commitment of dozens, scores of people. That means that it's a community, and what dancers will always tell you is it's a family. American Ballet Theater is a family, which is, of course, mm-hmm. just speaks to sort of the domesticity of any group that's kind of in its own little world together, but also about the fact that there are, you're not going to make it alone. You're going to make it because you have multiple choreographers, trainers, colleagues, dancers, musicians, you know, uh, working with you all at the same time. And that's, I find that so moving because there's a kind of a, both an expression of individuality that's clearly taking place, uh, at an extraordinary level, but also an expression of camaraderie, collegiality, of family, and that there's something beyond you. And that's what's really striking. So I think the, you know, the black swan thing, you know, the acid in the face, you know, horror, is really something which is, you know, that, as I say, that happens in any walk of life, sadly. But what's really the hallmark, it seems to me, of it, is this kind of wonderful, humane place where aspiration at the highest level and a kind of a true humility born of a sense that you're in it all together comes together. And that's what's really, that's if there's a DNA to the art form that I saw as a kind of an amateur looking in, that's what I saw. So it's kind of, you know, the, it bleeds, it leads stuff, you know, may make a temporarily good, you know, sort of structure for a movie, but actually really causes you to miss, I think, what's really, really central to what what ballet is at its best. So the reason I wanted to bring that up was just A, for that reason, and B, because one of the things you do in this film that I found so compelling is, first of all, the story is, it's, it's a circle. It's a circle of people who are intertwined, and that is the feel that you get of this just incredible generosity. I, I was surprised right, that's right. Yeah. by the generosity from the individual dancers and then as they worked as, as the team and one wanting to help the next one forward. I, this is just so different than I think most people have ever under, thought was, you know, because of the, the culture that we've made of ballet. What, what it is. I think you did a remarkable job of, of uh, portraying You know, that. I don't know, Isabella, didn't you, I mean, you know, as someone who kind of lives within it, that, that sense that, you know, of mutuality and reciprocity, it's such a powerful part of the life you live. It is, um, definitely. I mean, I, I, sure, it's competitive, it's very competitive, and I think we all have a competitive, you have to have a competitive personality because it drives you to improve, but I think that for the most part, everyone is so supportive, and we're really happy for each other. We really celebrate each other's successes and support each other when someone's down. People are very, I think, caring towards one another in general. Yeah, let's get to dance for a second. I want to talk to you guys about that, because dance in all its form is certainly evolutionary. And I'm thinking how so much of American dance, Isabella, has evolved from the street, the social commentary <laughs> societal expression. Compare that to me uh, to ballet, the very foundation, in my opinion, of dance. Do you think ballet is like breakdancing, for instance, reflective of the source <laughs> of which it derives? Do you know where I'm going with that, right? I think all forms of dance are definitely related, obviously. I, I don't know. I, thought, I, I found it so interesting hearing Alexei in um, Rick's film when he said that, I don't know exactly what he said, but um, that Every time a dancer performs a role, she's communicating with the past. Um, right, channeling the I, past, yeah. Yeah, channeling the past. I found that so interesting. Even though I, I never really think of that on a daily basis, like, I guess I kind of just take it for granted, but 
ballet is so unique in that regard that it's just really passed down from dancer to dancer. And, yeah, I it think was that's one thing yeah. that makes it unique. Because it, I thought, Rick, something that was said in the film was the fact that all of the original dances were never filmed. Exactly. Yeah, that's the yeah. thing in a funny way. Film is going to almost always miss what's there because, you know, in a way, it's, I mean, dance in this respect is no different from any art form. It's trying to use something that you can see, a human body, to show you something that you can't see, something that's going on inside the dancer, something that's resonating inside the watcher, something that's happening now, but connecting to something, as Isabel is saying, that began 400 years ago or was maybe choreographed in the late 19th century or maybe just 10 years ago or yesterday, but it's still not happening now. You know, that's the fate of all art. If it's only reducible to what you see, it's a cliché and it's dead. If it takes what you can see, an extraordinary dancer like Isabella, and evokes something that you can't see, then it's magic. Right. And that's, you know, that's where the combination of aspiration and even competitiveness and humility come from. Because you're always, I re- was really struck by something Susan Jaffe told us, you know, in the middle of her career, at the height of her career, she suddenly went, I can't get any better. I'm somehow reduced to merely the perfection I've sought. What's that all about? And she wanted to know, she said, where does movement come from? Not what is the movement you see, but what's the What's the invisible source of it, the motivation? And hence, in a way, the drama and the, the theater of American ballet theater, but of all dance. What's the thing that's kind of welling up within in some dark place you can't see that issues in a gesture, a movement that you can see? That's what you're trying to tap into. That's what these incredible people are trying to do, to use, to train their bodies in all these ways which are demonstrable and obvious, but you know what? It's not just about going over the bar. It's not just about gymnastics. To use the brilliance of an Olympic gymnast to get at something subtle, evanescent, internal, invisible, and enduring about what it is to be a human being in love, in hate, in heartbreak, in betrayal, in resignation, in... I mean, that's just an amazing, amazing thing. I don't want to judge culture. Culture evolves. Dance evolves. Form evolves. Athleticism evolves. But I'm curious as to what either of you would say to those who say that the ballet is no longer relevant. (laughs) I have to say, that's sounding more and more ridiculous every day, I think, because I think there's just increasing evidence that ballet is extremely relevant and... um, like, even present in pop culture. So, I don't know. I'm not sure I agree with that. I don't you know what? Agree. Movies are, are supposed to be dead. The novel is supposed to be dead. Dance <laughs> has died so many times, it's like the vampire form. You know, we, we interviewed extensively for our film Jennifer Homans, wonderful ex-dancer, wonderful historian of dance, who's sort of notorious in her book, Apollo's Angels, for sort of saying, you know what? Dance is done, at least for now. But what we found was when Jennifer started to talk about dance, every syllable that she uttered contradicted that thesis. She talked about what's released inside you and inside the watcher as dance takes place, the transcendent experience of it. And she wasn't putting it all in the past tense. She was hypnotized, even as she spoke, by the power of the form. In this case, she's committed her whole intellectual and emotional life to as as a writer and a historian. I'm telling you, I think, I think that far from being dead, what's amazing is that it is the vampire form. You know, it has had every opportunity to die. You know, kill the king in the French Revolution. The form should be over. It began in the court of Louis XIV. No, up it rises, and in a sense, Isabella Boylston was born because the ballerina and everything that we associate with it emerged after the French Revolution. You know, it's gone through multiple revolutions and multiple displacements from France to Russia to, you know, across Europe to America, each time having to adapt because you can't just rigidly repeat. And lo and behold, it has (laughs) Phoenix-like re-embodied itself, always now taking from the past, carrying it forward, and then finding in the context of the new and the now something new, something vital, something that allows it not just to be dead, but to be tremendously living. 
I'm telling you, I'm not like a dancer. I, you know, I had no idea I was ever going to make a dance film. I go in and watch what these people do and am carried away and transported. And if, you know, if that's a dead form, fine. I'm, I'm happy. Let it be dead because it's working. It's so live. It's so vital. You know, you could have fooled me. So I'm just telling you, in my view, in my completely untutored view, I think dance has arguably never been in better shape. More people from more countries are dancing in more multiple styles at the same time at a level of athleticism and perfection. The competition has never been higher. And it's not even now dominated by the kind of the 1970s, 1980s super megastar phenomenon, which both branded ballet around a, a, a small group of phenomenally gifted people, but in a way hid the fact that there's so much talent out there. I couldn't agree more. I find that there's a kind of a, a new thing about classics, be it classic artists, classic ballet, classic anything, seem somehow to have been denigrated to being, I don't know, what, uh, a fetism, if you will, rather than that it's the foundation. And I think that's where I want to go, because I think ballet is the foundation for every form of dance we see. Isabel, I bet you would agree with me, right? Mm -hmm. and, that mm -hmm. if you, right? and that if you're not classically trained at some point even in that, I'm, I would think that you, would lim you were limited, not just in, in, in style and in art, but in, in body, in, in the athleticism and the control of the, of the body. And that's what I think is, mm -hmm. like in your film, Rick, when you catch her and you see that body and you see those muscles and you see in that one moment, the red dress moment, I call it, um, yes. right? Then you understand the foundation of dance right there in that second. Either of you want to comment, or am I just talking to myself? No, no, I mean, I definitely think any, I mean, any sort of ballet education would help you in any other dance form, for sure. Probably any athletic endeavor, it would be useful. Yeah, I, I want to take it to this point, too. You know, Rick, it's interesting. Your, your, your education is interesting. English lit, philosophy, right? Yes? English literature, yeah. And, and philosophy. And, and I, I, want to, I think that's how you actually approached this film, using both sides, you know, your left and your right brain, which is what makes it so successful. And I would say, Isabella, we, we forget that ballerinas are also actresses, in your case, mm -hmm. actors, <laughs> who have to not only control the body and do that, but also emote, you know, the role. You're actually yeah. going to take uh, acting classes. And I think the success mm -hmm. of this film is those both sides of that. Mm -hmm. But Rick is the filmmaker, and you as the dancer. Fascinating to me. What do you think, Rick? I mean, in terms of that. You know, I think I, I took the, uh, you know, we talk about classic, the classics, and they do sometimes get denigrated as being a feat or elitist or, you know, somehow dedicated to um, something that's past or hierarchical or, or elitist. You know, that's ridiculous. I think any artist in any field knows that really what the classics really are are the enduring monuments that have been achieved within their art form that are still alive. So in a way, classic doesn't mean dead. Classic means eternally living, which usually means it has to be then adapted and evolved into something which makes what was fantastic 400 years ago equally fantastic now, which is this funny chemistry of both continuity and transformation. That's what a classic is. A classic is something which, when it began, when it erupted, was some strange ratio of the eternal and the absolutely novel, which is what Isabel is trying to do every time she gets out there and uses her body to, use, to show you something which you can't see. So I just think that, you know, you know, I think what I learned was there's a profound kind of harmony amongst almost all artistic pursuits, which dance in a way stands for. Dance, the young Terpsichore, the younger sister of the muse of music, shows us in a funny way what all art can possibly be at, at its best, which is that joining of the now and the enduring. And what, you know, what's, what, you know, what are we all trying to do? We're all trying to be here now and at the same time not pass away. And to have an art form that's so powerfully existing right at that intersection 
of the now and the passing away and taps into that again and again and again. That's something which, you know, if you're an English literature major, major, you know, you're seeing that in Shakespeare or in a play that was, you know, a Tom Stoppard play that was in, written 20 years ago or in something brand new on stage tomorrow. It's, it's nothing more or less than the eternal human quest to both be and to endure. And that's what the classics are all about. And that's why I say what, you know, my colleagues and I really felt one of the main things we learned is that ballet was a extraordinary discovery. It was a discovery of the science, of the art, of human expressiveness in the body. And that has been, it was codified, literally codified, the five positions, you know, centrally in part of that, and handed down, but not because it's some kind of, form which you're required through some external law to learn, but because it still is vital, as Isabella could tell, say much more eloquently than me, it's still absolutely crucial to unlocking the, the expressive power of the human form. That's why she goes in there and takes class every day. That's why she brings her body back into that alignment, because when you do that, you're opening up yourself, your body, and therefore anybody in your vicinity to the expressive power of what you're getting to. Let, let, me, let me say this. I think it's very interesting that Isabella, the American Ballet Theater, the ballet, and we can talk about it in terms of whether or not it's a fetus or it isn't. But you know, Rick, what you actually did in this film was create your own ballet. And you also achieved the perfection, in my opinion, because really I was so taken by this movie, I can't begin to tell you. So Um, grateful to him, so take such courage for that. I mean, that that what we're actually talking about is whatever, whoever the artist is and whatever the medium that they use to express their art, be it the ballet or filmmaking, that's why do we look at ballet and say, oh, and too many look at, not you and I, or the three of us here, but too many do, and yet we look at filmmaking and we don't say the same thing, and yet what you've created was the same ballet that she creates. Do you understand where I'm going with that? It's a big picture, um, and this is how my You know what, I think, I think I do, and I'll just say really briefly rather than gabbling on, that you know what, um, you know, film, everybody has an iPhone, cell phone, video camera, everybody can be a filmmaker, and that's good. You know, since the beginning of the form, since photography was invented in the beginning of cinema, you know, of cinema in the late 19th, early 20th century, I mean, come on, it's out there. It can be done, and it can be done a lot. Here's the thing. It can be done badly. It can be done well. It can be done with commitment. It can be done sort of as a throwaway. It's a lot harder to do that in dance. You know, you don't, so I think what happens is dance is sort of, in a way, hidden behind a veil which is that it takes so much to get to the point where you're even doing it at all. So much training. A mediocre ballerina has gone through an enormous amount of training. She can't just, quote, pick up the cell phone of her body and begin doing it. Right. So I think that that in a way, ballet is both hidden by and protected by the fact that it takes an enormous amount just to get in the door. Whereas film, you know... It's in a way, it's the ultimate seemingly democratic form in that the instrument's available now almost to anybody. But I can tell you from the humbling experience of being a filmmaker that to try to do it at any level that tries to do some remote justice to what Isabella is doing, boy, is that humbling. Boy, does it take the commitment of your of every fiber in you. You're going to fail more often than not. You're going to fall on the floor. You're going to discover that it's boring, that it's unclear, that nobody's interested in it, and you just have to keep at it. So I just think that what I love, it's why I think of dance as, in a way, the executive um, art form of all art forms. It's not different from all other art forms, film included. It's the one that helplessly has to stand for what the highest standard possibly is. And so it reminds me, that's why I found it so humbling as a filmmaker to be there. I went, right, yeah. right. You're gonna, you gotta get up every day and practice. You gotta do it twenty five thousand times and fail most of those times, and then boom, some absolutely undeniable magic may happen. 
And if you can get that far, mazel tov. But that's, okay, but you know, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's what question. I really, I, that's why I really, my hat is off to this form. But let me, here's to both of you. I could give you the camera, I could give Joe Schmo the camera, and what that Joe Schmo might do with the camera versus what, what Rick Burns does with the camera could be very, two very different things. I could say to Isabella, dance, and I could say to, you know, Julie, whatever, you dance. Talent does play a huge part in all of this. So, are you guys underselling yourselves? <laughs> you were part of it. Well, I understand that to get where you got, but you had to have had an innate talent or something that made you different that you were the one who propelled to the top. And same with you, Rick. You know, I don't want to sound falsely modest in any way, but I, I think that I don't want to say that talent is oversold, but I'll tell you there are a lot of talented people who don't get the thing that Susan Jaffe got at the height of her career. Where does motion come from? And you know what? Every art form has to deliver more than what you see on the outside. You know, if your film just gives you what you're seeing, your film is failing. If any dancer, if Isabella only shows you the leap she has worked her lifetime to do, she's failed. Because it has to take you someplace inside. And I just think that, you know, talent, great. We, you know, Isabella, you are so talented. How about feeling, commitment, perseverance, and an honesty? Have I got there yet? Yeah. Is the window really open? Oh, talk to me about honesty, Isabella. I don't know. I think what's really compelling when I watch a dancer on stage is when you see that she has sort of an inner life and like there's something that she's saying to you and you it might be abstract, you might not know what it is, but there's like a hidden meaning or yeah, inner life is the best way to describe it, I think. I think that's what's so compelling to the audience. And I think to do that you have to be honest with yourself as a performer. It's not superficial. It comes from a deeper place. And then hopefully all of that comes out through your movement, through your physicality. Okay. I like that. Because I think that that is what is so amazing. You know, some of those people that you captured on the film, Rick, what was so compelling about what they were saying is it was honest. It was pure. It was true. And you, as you said, you were so intimate. You get in with that camera and you can see people's heart and their soul and their honesty in this film. I felt that so strongly, Holly. I I did. You know, that we found it. We didn't know this, but, you know, when we were, the, for me, the best part of our filming, the thing that was so rewarding was taking Isabella and eight or nine of her colleagues up to an incredible dance center in Tivoli, New York, Kotzbahn Dance Center, where now they were kind of dancing for us, so to speak. We weren't just following them into the studio or rehearsal or in performance one place or another. They were now in a space at our behest and dancing, doing class, doing rehearsal, and also then performing for our cameras you know, the super slow motion camera, uh, but three or four or five other cameras as well. And what we discovered is something we hadn't really anticipated. When you, when Isabella dances for a few minutes and then you rush up to her kind of um, presumptuously with the camera and say, hey, what do you think? What do you feel? It's almost like she's taken a truth serum. She can't not speak the truth. And the camera shows you that. Because she's just, partly because it's like any athlete. They're breathing heavily. They're sweating. They're kind of, you know, their body is not lying. But they've they've gone someplace where they can't lie either. And I'm not even saying that there's any predisposition to it. But even some of the subtle forms of subterfuge all of us use stripped away. And there you are with with an extremely talented person. And there's your camera. And you're asking them the most banal question. How do you feel? You know, where were you? You know, what happened? And that honesty, it's almost as if there's a kind of a dying ember of where the dance has taken the dancer, which the camera can watch as it kind of cools visibly in front of you. And I'll bet, Isabella, you know exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) I guess. Let me take this here. Thanks for leading me into my final two questions because that's what they're about. It's about transformation. So I'm always curious, Rick, how one is transformed by their art. So how are you transformed in the making of this brilliant film? Well, first of all, thank you for, I'm so so grateful to you for that it kind of spoke to you. You know, 
you always manage to find a way in it to see that what you're doing is an analogy for the thing that you're doing. So that, like, you know, I felt like there's so many ways in which the course of making this project felt like a little metaphor for the dance world. First of all, we were underfunded. Right. Uh, second of all, it took 10 years. Um, and, you know, it, it was like nothing was easy. There was no There was no moment where, like, just everything just sprang to life and it all fell together. Because you know what? It's never like that. Um, and so, you know, really, I, I felt that what I learned was, listen, you're only going to go through that kind of trouble for something that's worth it. <laughs> and my colleagues and I went at the end of the day, man, this is the most worth it project we've ever been involved with because it's taken us someplace so deep and so powerful and so universal. So you just kind of like a little bit like the ancient mariner, you know, comes back after like a wild, you know, voyage around the world. You kind of want to grab people by the lapel in the street and say, look, this is what we saw. This is where we've been. This is what we found, you know, and we think it's like super powerful. Um, and in a way, it's just what's available to anybody, you know. Go, you know, go watch ABT. Go to the ballet tomorrow. And if you just sit there quietly for a moment and then open your eyes and your heart, you're going to be blown away. So we got blown away and wanted to take people where we had gone. Isabella, you're now part of ABT history, the very thing that this mm-hmm. film was made about, the history of ABT, 75 years. You're part of it. You're part of history. How amazing, right? <laughs> so your talent. Think, yeah. yeah. Think about that. So your talent is, is your contribution to ABT. Our luck is the audience mm-hmm. to watch your brilliant work, by the way, because I've been telling how wonderful Thanks. his brilliant film is, but your brilliant art. Guys, there's a moment <laughs> with, with Isabel that you will just not believe. But I have to believe that being a dancer in the American Ballet Theater Company, you realizing your dream has given you something, too. How have you been transformed? Uh, I don't know. It's hard to say because, I mean, I guess ballet has just been my life. <laughs> um <laughs> I don't know. I don't really know anything else. So, but yeah, the so, past no, ten years else. that I've been in ABC has been yeah. Um, yeah, an incredible growing and learning experience for me. Short life for a ballet dancer professionally. What ha- yeah. what, what happens next? Do you know? Um, I don't know. I I don't really think about it too much. I figure I have at least another. 10 or 15 years, so (laughs) just try to make the most of it, and hopefully the transition into the next phase will happen gracefully. (laughs) I'm sure it will, Isabella, but don't go go anytime soon, please. Here's what I'm saying, gracefully. Is there anybody more graceful than Isabella Boston? (laughs) That's a great word to use. Darling, because that is so, so you. Absolutely. Well, if you see me off stage, I'm not so graceful, but thank you. <laughs> Why do I not believe that, Rick? Tell us who she is. Today. You know, it's just these these people. Um, you know, I don't I don't think of myself as a groupie, and I don't certainly don't want to sound like one. <laughs> this is an incredibly talented, unusual kind of person who gets to dance at the level that Isabella, you're dancing. Um, and you know it's a gift, and you know it's um, something that you've, you know, you're talented, you're able to bring it to that level, but it's a very, very small, very, very small group of people. There are vastly more, you know, Major League Baseball players than there are Major mm-hmm. League dancers um, at this level. And, you know, I think for the rest of us, like watching astronauts go to the moon, we know they're not doing it by themselves. We know it takes an in, it takes a society to bring them about, an enormous talent and gifts. But at the end, we got to stand back and just go. They're going to the moon, and we're watching them, and we're going with them because they're doing it. And I just think that when you're, you know, like being in front of Shakespeare, like being in front of any art at its highest, you just got to go. Thank God it exists, and in dance. It, because it's not written down, because it's not a play in a book, but rather something which only exists, you know, in any meaningful way, in Isabella's body or Marcella's body or Misty's body or Joseph Gorak's body or Daniel Simpson's body. That's where it is. 
that's where it's happening. And so the gratitude, I think, that all of us need, not need to, will instinctively feel towards this group of people for, A, sure, having the talent, having the commitment, and then actually really doing it, really going to the moon, boy, you just want to go, I'm so glad I live in a world where people are capable of going to the moon. And so, you know, I'm so grateful, Isabella, to you and to your, you know, wondrous group of colleagues um, at ABT. Wow. You're reminding us why it's all worthwhile. Thank you. And thank you for depicting our art form with such respect. Really, yeah. It was a privilege of a lifetime. I've been speaking with filmmaker Rick Burns and one of the American Ballet Theater's principal dancers, Isabella Boston. If you'd like to view Rick Burns' documentary, American Ballet Theater, A History, it is now streaming on pbs.org, American Masters, and available on DVD from PBS Distribution, and also available on Amazon.com and in fine retail stores everywhere. American Ballet Theater, A History, is part of the American Masters series, produced by 13 for WNET. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Helen Cancer Jane Show. A production of Resac LLC. Associate producer, Suzanne Probst. Music by Tony Rosales Jazz. Visit HellyCancerJane.com.